some of our goals are really high and we don't necessarily know exactly how we're going to hit them, but it stretches us and we show up differently and come out on the other side differently, stronger, better, more strategic. I'm Amy Porterfield, ex-corporate girl turned CEO of a multi seven-figure business. But it wasn't all that long ago that I lacked the confidence, the budget, and the time to focus on growing my small but mighty business. Fast forward past many failed attempts and lessons learned, and you'll see the business I have today. One that changes lives and gives me more freedom than I ever thought possible. One that used to only exist as a daydream. I created the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast to give you simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies to help you do the same. If you're an ambitious entrepreneur or one in the making who's looking to create a business that makes an impact and a life you love, you're in the right place, friend. Let's get started. Hey there, welcome back to Online Marketing Made Easy. I am thrilled that you're here today. Today, I'm jumping into a topic that's near and dear to my heart, team empowerment and performance. As business owners, we know that our success is directly tied to the performance of our team members, right? So the question becomes, how do we inspire and encourage our team to continuously uplevel their game? It's a question that I've been asking myself since I made my first hire quite some time ago. And like anything in business, it's taken a lot of trial and error. And while I'm not saying I have perfected it completely, I am so very proud of the fact that I am at the helm of a high-performing team that consistently rises to the occasion and exceeds expectations without constantly feeling burnt out. So I hope you're excited because in this episode, I'm going to share my best tips on how I create a culture of growth and excellence within my team. Now, I hesitated to do this episode because obviously I'm not 100% perfect at this. I don't always get it right. And I've definitely struggled with hiring and making sure we have the right people. And then more importantly, supporting the people that we've brought into our team. I've had my misses for sure, my challenges, like all of us, right? However, I do feel that because we've put so much intentionality behind this, and because it is one of the most important things we think about in terms of growing the business means you've got to grow a team, like that's how we think. I think we've gotten it right a lot of the time, especially over the last few years as my team has grown and there's been even a bigger need to make sure we do get this right. So I wanted to share with you what's been working on my team, and hopefully you can apply this to your team. Even if you have one person, one VA, or a few people or contractors, these strategies can be applied in different ways, or some of them you can put in your back pocket. And remember, you'd love to bring them out when it's appropriate and as your team begins to grow. So essentially, whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur looking to take your team to the next level, or you're just starting out and eager to build a high-performing team from the ground up, this episode is for you. Now, before we get started, I have a quick, quick question for you. Have you ever shared this podcast with an entrepreneurial friend, maybe someone who's still in a nine to five job, but they would love to go out on their own, or you know, they have talents and skills that the world needs, and you're encouraging them to start their own thing. Well, if you've never shared it, could you do me a favor and just grab a link to this episode or the podcast as a whole, and just send it to a friend, text it, email it, send it through social media, whatever might work. But I would love to reach as many people as possible that need to hear these marketing messages and these mindset messages for entrepreneurs. So I'd be forever grateful. Okay, so the first thing we do to empower our team is offer incentives and rewards because let's be real, money talks. Specifically, we have an annual bonus structure for every single person on the team. Here's how it works. At the beginning of the year, we outline our revenue, our profit and profit margin goals for the entire year. Now, this is important because we need to make sure that we get this right. In the past, where I've messed up with this is if we use our revenue and our profit margin goal as an indicator for bonuses and incentives, you can't be changing that number all year long. 
And if you do change, it has to benefit your team and it can't actually hurt them if you are changing your goal. So the goal is to not change the goal, okay? The gross revenue and profit goals are dollar values and they're based on the profit dollar value number. So incentives and bonuses are based on the profit dollar value number and we have a tiered bonus structure. So let me explain it. So if we end the year with 90% of our way to that profit number, the team gets a certain additional percentage of their salary. If we end it at 95% or 100% or 105% of the way, they get more percentage of their salary. Anything below 90%, no one's getting a bonus. But if we hit 90% to goal, based on our profit number, the team is getting additional percentage as a bonus based off their salary. And then if we hit 95%, they get more, 100% more, 105% even more. And if we exceed our goal by 110%, they get the highest percentage possible based on their salary. So anything 110% or higher, that's gonna be the biggest bonus. And we do this so that every single person on the team at every level in every department feels a sense of ownership and accomplishment for how we do as a business. So that's the first way we incentivize the entire team. I have to tell you that we've done this for, I think, two years now. I've always done bonuses one way or another, but this one feels right. This is the first time that I feel like, okay, for so long, I've given random bonuses just at the end of the year, and that didn't seem to work well. And one of my employees who was a director said, I just can never plan ahead. I never know if I'm going to get a bonus or not. I don't know what to expect. I'm confused how you're even deciding it. And that's fair. So that's why we wanted to get more organized. So this took us a long time to get here, but we could have done it years and years ago. It's just that I didn't have anyone to like model. And finally, someone explained to me their system and I kind of stole it from them. So made it my own, but you know, so I was like, oh, I should share this with all of you because this might be something you want to do now or in the future. We're also really big on holidays and time off. So I'm moving away from the money side of it. If you've been listening for a while, you know that my team and I only work four day work weeks. We take Fridays off. And that is great because we get a jump start to our weekend. I never really realized this, but I've talked about this before. My niece, Ava, is now working for me. She went to Baylor. She just graduated. She's in our product development department working on content. She's a writer. And I picked her up at the airport the other day. And I knew she was going on vacation. She went to Boston and New York with her friends. And I said, how long have you been gone? Because I don't know the comings and goings of everyone on the team. And she's like, 10 days. And I said, you took 10 days off? Because she's kind of fairly new. And so I was just surprised that and we're in a really busy season. And she's like, no, I took four days off. And I'm like, what? Well, she's like, well, if you count Friday, Saturday and Sunday, you leave for your vacation on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then you don't work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then you take Friday, Saturday and Sunday off. You've got 10 days. I'm like, oh, I didn't even realize that. So literally one of my team members can take 10 days off on a vacation, but really only miss four days of work because we work a four-day work week. That is an incentive. That is attractive to somebody who values their time off. They love to travel. They love to get away. Like that's a big deal. So when I realized that, I was like, oh, dang, I kind of love it for my team members. And then in terms of holidays, we give paid time off for days beyond standard American holidays, like beyond Christmas and 4th of July. We take a company break from Christmas Eve until the day after New Year's Day to reset and recharge. We also take the day before and after Thanksgiving. I got to give a shout out to my girl, Marie Forleo. One year, Chloe, my old ride or die, she's my dear friend still, but she used to work in the team. We were sitting at the kitchen table. It was Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, which is always on a Thursday, right? So it was Wednesday. And we were working on some funnel or something. And we were like tired. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon. We couldn't wait till the holiday. And I went online and I realized Marie was making up mashed potatoes in the kitchen the day before Thanksgiving. And her whole team, I think, was off. I think it was her and her team were off. And I thought, 
yes, we need the day before Thanksgiving. That's fun. People are coming into town. Many of us are getting ready for family. So we take Wednesday off. And then of course, Thanksgiving, and then of course, that Friday off. So we've got much of that week off. And I think that's fun to prep our pies and cut our veggies and make our mashed potatoes and all of that. And then finally, we have unlimited PTO, personal time off. I'm a big believer that taking the time you need helps you to show up your very best at work. So we don't put restrictions on vacation time. Oddly enough, nobody abuses this. Like you can't leave your position if it's not covered, if you haven't done the work you need to do. And everyone feels very responsible for their roles. So they've been incredibly responsible about taking this time off and making sure everything's covered. The other thing we do is give rewards during our live launches. So this is really fun. In each phase of a launch, we have a total goal. But along the way, we also have benchmark goals. So if we hit them, the team gets prizes. So we roll out the prizes that are potential prizes if we hit certain goals before the launch so the team knows what we're working towards. So for example, when we're about 50% of the way to our total sales goal for cart open, we'll give something like a red light therapy mask. I have mostly women on the team, but the men love a red light mask as well. So that might be one of the prizes. Or when we're at 75% of our way to goal, we might give something like Apple AirPods. When we're 100% of the way to our goal, we might give away an Airbnb gift card. Now, remember, I make a lot of money with my launches. We do well, so the prizes are pretty fancy. For this one launch, if it's a smaller launch, they're not going to be that good. And you do not need to give away these big prizes. It could be a $20 gift card to Amazon. People just love winning prizes. But the fun thing is we literally set all these benchmarks. And the reason we do this, and I remember when we first did this, the first time, I think it was Chloe's idea. We wanted the whole team to be paying attention, to want to know where we're at in the launch, how close we are, what we need to do to get to 100%. We wanted them fully invested, engaged, and aware of the whole experience. There were launches years and years ago where I didn't even share with the team how much money we were making or where we were at or how close we were to goal. Like they were literally in the dark. And I, I was so young at business, I didn't even know that that was important. But then I'm like, why doesn't everyone feel excited and engaged? They don't even know what we're doing, like in terms of how we're doing. And so this was like a whole shift for me. It's just really something fun for the team to be like, okay, 10 more leads. Like we do it for leads. We do it for sales. We do it for how many people get into the boot camp. Like we've got goals throughout the whole thing. And it's a lot of work to figure it all out in advance, but it's so fun. So they might be 10 more leads and we're going to get the Stanley Cup or whatever it is. So it's not the Stanley Cup, like the trophy, you know what I mean? The Stanley, what are they called? Mugs or whatever. You got it. You got what I mean. So it's so fun to see the chatter in Slack. Like if we have a gift card, like what are you all getting at Amazon or we give away like a gift card to special sunglasses. What kind of sunglasses are you getting? Like, it's just super fun. And then sometimes we give prizes out randomly. So for instance, sometimes we'll do happy hour in Help Scout, which means we've got a lot of customer support tickets. This happens usually around a promotion. So we need people that aren't in our customer experience department to jump in and help. So we'll do, okay, we got a happy hour in Help Scout. If you can give us an hour to knock out a bunch of tickets, we'd greatly appreciate it. And then the people that do jump in, we'll give them gift cards to different things just to thank them. Or we'll do random cash prizes, quick little bonuses. We call them spot bonuses. Like if someone just goes above and beyond, we might say like, here's an extra $500. We saw what you did there. We knew that wasn't part of your job description, but you jumped in. So we just want people to be recognized. But it's also important to remember, not everybody is driven by money. I am. I like to make a lot of money. I like to invest a lot of money. I like to give a lot of money, whether it be through charitable opportunities or back to my team. I just have always been motivated by money and I don't feel bad about that. But I know that not everyone is driven by money. So some want experiences or the recognition, of course, the promotions. So those are just other ways that we understand that. But I'm talking more primarily today about different prizes and cash prizes and physical different fun things. But I'm aware that not everyone is driven by that. And I think 
you become a really great leader. And this is something I need to really work on to understand each individual person on your team and what drives them and what lights them up. And then if you can uniquely incentivize them that way, that's pretty cool as well. I don't think we've really mastered that on the team yet, but we do a little bit of that. We are aware of who's driven by money and those types of rewards and who's not. And we try to be mindful of that. Okay. So if at any point I lost you, come back to me because here's where it gets a little bit tricky. Incentives and rewards are so fantastic, but how the heck do you encourage your team to perform without pushing too hard or creating burnout? So this is a little bit of a different conversation, but it's around culture. And I'll be honest, this has been something we've worked really hard at over the last few years. We're a team that is very driven by our goals revenue goals, conversion goals, registration goals, all of it. And when we don't hit those goals as a team, we naturally feel let down. So one of the things my CEO, Jaws, has been doing is trying to shift the team's mindset around meeting goals. Of course, we want to meet our goals. But if we hit every single goal, we're not setting our goals high enough to stretch ourselves. So interesting perspective, right? The first time she said this to me, I was really frustrated. We didn't hit a goal this year. And she's like, if we hit every goal, then we are playing it safe. Some of our goals are really high and we don't necessarily know exactly how we're going to hit them, but it stretches us and we show up differently and come out on the other side differently, stronger, better, more strategic. The purpose of having goals, she reminded me, is to have something to aim towards. It doesn't mean you're always going to hit it. It's just something you're moving towards. So we all know what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we're doing it. So it's really about reinforcing the mindset of, yes, we're all still doing a great job, even if we don't hit every single goal we've set for ourselves. For example, I remember a launch in 2021 where we were so off on the big goal. We were like, 50, maybe 60% of the way to the goal, which felt terrible. So we had to have a conversation with the team that was something like this. Okay, so we got a few hundred new students. We had projected a thousand. That doesn't feel great. We didn't hit our goal, but those are a few hundred human beings whose lives are going to be impacted and changed by what we teach them. So we can't lose sight of the fact that sure, we wanted a thousand new students in this program we had launched, but we only got a few hundred, but these are beating hearts. These are people that are hopeful to make a difference in the world. These are people that are counting on us. We have to care more about them, the gain versus the gap, but there's a few hundred students we didn't get. That's where that book, The Gap and the Gain, really plays a part. Let's focus on the gain, these new, wonderful human beings that just came into our world. And when we put it in that type of perspective, a couple hundred sounds really significant. And so always coming back to what we're doing and why we're doing it as a leader can alleviate the pressure on the team, which in turn relieves some of that burnout that we might be causing when we're like, we didn't hit our goal. What are we going to do? We didn't hit our goal. So it's so incredibly important. Also, I recently interviewed Dr. Ben Hardy, who was a co-author of The Gap and the Gain, but he also wrote a book that I'm obsessed with, 10X is Easier Than 2X. And we interviewed him. I say we, because Jasmine Starr and I did like a dual co-hosting for her podcast, but I'm going to get to put those interviews on my podcast as well, anytime like after June or beyond. But my point being is he was talking about working with a client and how the client's like, we didn't hit the goal. I'm really frustrated. The team knows I'm frustrated, but we're moving on. We're going on to the next thing. And he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't have to belabor the point that you didn't hit the goal. And you definitely don't have to make your team feel terrible about it. But you do need to dissect what you did and what possibly went wrong. Because if we can learn from this, we definitely will do better next time. So it's not about harping on everything that was wrong, but really using it as data and really understanding what did that promotion look like? Dissect it, spend a little time on it, then we'll move on. We don't have to live there. But I love that he's like, but we do need to use it as data. And so I think that's a little bit of a different perspective as well. 
And then finally, I want to talk about creating a supportive environment, because obviously this is all about building up your culture. And I want to create a supportive environment where everyone feels valued for their contributions. So for instance, if one of my departments has pulled double time during a launch, or a particular team member has stepped up in a really big way, we may get a point to rally around that person or that team and show them how much they're appreciated. Something like, hey, we see you, you're a rock star, we appreciate you, thank you for all you do. I mean, I worked plenty of jobs before where I haven't felt appreciated, And true, genuine words go a long way. So remember, appreciation is just not a nicety. And it's not all about rewards and money and bonuses. But really, actually putting into words what you appreciate about your team and pointing out when they go above and beyond or when they do an exceptional job, calling them out like we do it in Slack. We have a Slack channel for all of our employees and that's where we celebrate each other and we do it on a regular basis. I know it probably it's like, yeah, duh, Amy, you should do that. But do we do it enough? And I wanted just to wrap up this episode by mentioning how important it is to give those shout outs to those that are contributing to your business. All right, my friend, I hope you found this shorty episode valuable. Thank you for hanging out with me here. It's always so fun to share behind the scenes of what we're doing in our business and what works and what doesn't and the things that I've done well and the things that I've done terrible. And I wanna share all of that with you. So this is one of those episodes that we've worked on our culture and got it wrong for many years. So when it finally started to click over the last few years, I thought this is something that I could share with you. So hopefully one, you can integrate it into your business, but also sidestep some of the mistakes that I made along the way to get here. All right, thanks so much for tuning in and I will see you Thursday for more entrepreneurial goodness. Same time, same place, can't wait.